Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this uh, panel discussion on Iran uh, hosted here in Washington, D.C. by the Global Policy Institute and Bay Atlantic University. Uh, my name is Paolo von Schirach, and I'm uh, privileged to serve as uh, uh, the president of the Global Policy Institute, uh, a, a nonpartisan research institution in, again, in downtown Washington. Um, tied to, connected with, uh, and cooperating with Bay Atlantic University. I also serve as the Chair of Political Science and International Relations at Bay Atlantic University. So today, our goal is to try to shed some light on the admittedly extremely complicated issue of Iran and, uh, and try to see if we can uh, find some common ground among uh, our distinguished panelists who join us from Europe uh, and uh, uh, different countries in Europe, Italy, France, Turkey, and of course our own uh, associate, uh, GPI fellow and faculty member, Fazl, who has been a student of, uh, of Iran for, for many, many years. So hopefully, you know, if we try together, we may identify maybe uh, a better way to deal with this uh, Iran conundrum. Uh, years ago, you know, the international community thought it had found a way, which was uh, this uh, big compromise agreement that essentially, I think we can all agree, as a minimum, restrained and constrained the uh, existing Iran nuclear program. And the subtext, not part of the deal, let's be clear, was, at least here in Washington, but in other capitals probably the same, that by creating a more relaxed and so somewhat, uh, um, you know, um, less uh, stressful atmosphere uh, between Iran and key Western countries, that this might contribute to the lessening of tensions in the region. Notably, you know, uh, tone that Iran would tone down what is perceived, rightly or wrongly, certainly here in Washington, as an aggressive behavior in the region. You know, and you know the list is long: uh, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, you know, Yemen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so <clears throat> that you know that finally, eventually, at some point, Iran would become quote a normal country. Of course, all that came to an end with the Trump presidency and, uh, and Mr. Trump's uh, idea that this deal was bad, was terrible, and that America had to get out of it as soon as possible, which it did eventually. Uh, and now we, and, and then it reverted to a policy quote of maximum pressure. Now we're several years into this uh, new approach. And quite frankly, it's hard to see what it has uh, accomplished, to be honest with you. That's my own interpretation, but I'm obviously I want to hear from you. So why don't we just uh, start with this puzzle. Let me ask, start with you as, as you are here in Washington. Give me, give us uh, your your quick reading, uh, as succinctly as you can, of the uh, sanctions policy of the uh, Trump administration, and uh, what where what did it bring? Um, thank you, Paolo, for having me. And let me try to be very specific to your uh, to answering your question. So, um, assessing whether there's a better way to understand this with sanctions in mind, you have to keep in context with the fact of, on one side, there was this emphasis of containing Iran and another in fear of whether it could be containable. Um, there has been success in containing Iran in the US economic embargo. Iran's unemployment is staggeringly high, at present at 11.38%. It is currently, um, I mean, the currency, the real has devalued so badly that in August 2019, Iran's central bank had to slash four zeros to prop up the value. Um, inflation is high at 41.06% uh, as of last year. It has creeped up to, I believe, 47% now. Um, oil sales are determined by world markets, which hasn't helped Iran. It needs much more than the $40 per barrel to get at least um, a surplus in its budget. Um, Rouhani's government has tried to di diversify away from the hydrocarbon economy. It has incentivized schemes to expand the private sector, but wealthy Iranians continue to invest elsewhere. 
and the private sector is simply unable to meet such expectations given the natural IRGC interference. So where Iran has been able to be contained is in what we know as the arms embargo that is now extended beyond uh, October 18th. Um, it has a double-edged kind of a setting. On one side, you see a reduction of activities, but you also see uh, an expansion of its activities in Syria, Iraq, and Yemen. Um, ban on uranium enrichment and processing. Um, in one sense, it looks like it's working, but um, when IAEA says that Iran is actually cooperating, but this kind of cooperation is Iran's version of cooperation not necessarily that of the Trump, administrat that Trump administration's predilection. Uh, there's a ban in place on testing of ballistic missiles and transfer of nuclear technology, and there's a component of missile development. Um, all certainly hasn't worked uh, because testing continues in undisclosed locations. Uh, there is uh, the, the incident of the launching of the Khormshar missile in 2017, which has a range of roughly about 1,200 miles. Uh, was seen and endorsed by President Rouhani as a deterrent. Now, this has actually taken even a more drastic shape after the withdrawal of the JCPOA in May 2018. Uh, the regime has actually expanded, it, expanded its activity on uh, detention of citizens of the West, of Iranian origin, primarily the famous Nazanin Zakari Ratcliffe, uh, and they're held in, essentially in a format of ransom. Um, Sorry, can I, can I just uh, stop, stop you there for a moment? Let, but let, let's get to the, to, to, let, to, to, the, to the real point, Fazal. The objective of maximum pressure uh, was mm -hmm. to force behavioral change in Tehran. Have, has that been accomplished? Are we forcing, are, are the Iranians say, okay, sorry, sorry, enough, we can't take this anymore. Let's sit down and find another deal that would be to the satisfaction of Washington. That's not happened, right? Is it, it going to happen in short answer, on this uh, short answer, answer. premises? No. No. Okay. Well, so essentially, while you, as you described with the, you know a, a great deal of detail, the, while the Iranian economy is really suffering a great deal, the country is not at least at the moment, not on its knees. It's not saying, oh my God, we're done, we're finished. We, we, we have to do something, right? We, we're not there at the moment, at least. No, so let me expand just by a little bit on that front. So there is, uh, the, the state has non-sanctionable off the book assets. Um, they have leverage, but during even this time of the pandemic, they have prioritized internal security and regional security and not on humanitarian efforts. Okay. Um, let, me, let me just switch to the other panelists here. Uh, Arzu, how, how do you, you know, from Turkey, from, from your perspective and as an observer of, of, uh, of, of Iran affairs, how, how do you view all this? How do you assess the, you know, whether you agree or disagree with the sanctions? That's a different story. But from your perspective, have the sanctions been effective? Have, have they accomplished anything? Um, well, in my point of view, sanctions are never work, actually. Uh, if you are talking about uh, the sanctions in Iranian nuclear crisis, the, 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 the just period of time that the sanctions were uh, was successful was the time before JCPOA, um, because both the United States, the EU, uh, and Russia and China was untagged, and uh, within the framework of the United Nations Security Council altogether worked uh, coherently and uh, they convinced the Iranian government to, to come to the table and sign this Iranian deal, actually. This was a time that, uh, for the first time ever, Iranian, uh, the sanctions was successful on the Iranian nuclear crisis. Uh, when we look to the Iran, Iran has been sanctioned for more than 40 years, and um, they know how to live with this. And on the other hand, Iran has the oil, and when you have oil, you will always have some black markets. And when you have this strategy card, you will always have uh, the, the, the chance to securing out the sanctions. And uh, the Iranian government, for its survival, know how to cope with this. 
Uh, more sanctions, no, I don't think that the sanctions are fruitful. Uh, they are just pressuring on the Iranian people, not the Iranian governments, because um, now we have black markets and this money running somehow. And you know, don't know that uh, who sells what to who and where this money goes. So just the Iranian economy is under the pressure and people feel the extremely negative effects of that sanctions. Uh, but if you are talking about the behavior change of the government, no, nothing has been changed. Again, we have the same thing that the United States uh, has complained for more than year, several years. So uh, sanctioning Iran doesn't work. I mean, if you are sanctioning Iran to, to, to make the Iranian people uprising, it doesn't, again, fruitful because they don't have the leader, they don't have the gun, they don't have the power. So... Iranian government can surpass them and um, they are not in a position to, to uh, say, object to, go to the government. And another reality here is that uh, we, we saw it in the history many times. Uh, while the foreign intervention inside the Iran happens, all the people in the Iran come together and uh, make a cement effect in the Iranian society. Um, so I think that with regard to Iranian issues, um, regarding the, the, the Iranian nuclear program, uh, this issue is not the, just the technical Iranian nuclear program. And now we know this after the Trump's uh, new strategy. And uh, you have to come back to the table and saying that, okay, we are back on the table and we are um, eliminating some of the sanctions, but you have to do something in your behavior and uh, you have to negotiate it on the table, not outside of the table. Those kind of things just are negative effects on the Iranian uh, policies. Now in the Iran, the hardliners are more stronger than ever. And uh, I'm sure that uh, even after the, the um, American elections, even the Biden government will be uh, on its duties, uh, that the hardliners will be in power in Iran and the Iran will not be the same Iran that uh, he used to deal 10 years ago. Okay. Michelle McKinsky, give us a, your perspective. I know we had, the, you know, we talked about this just a few days ago informally. Uh, how, how is uh, France and other European countries that you're familiar with how are they coping? How, how are they coping to try to maintain some semblance of normalcy, um, you know, with Iran under the cloud of sanctions? How is that working? And, uh, and first of all, I asked the same question I asked everybody else, and I will ask uh, Professor Redoeli too. Are the, ha has anything really worked according to the will of the administration in Washington? That's the first question. Yes or no? That's an uh, easy one. <laughs> the answer is clear and clear is no, and I concur with what has just been said by Asu. I would add two or three things. First of all, uh, we are focusing on Trump. We should not forget uh, the fact that during Obama's term, uh, GCPOE has not been properly implemented by the United States, in particular. Uh, even if formally uh, uh, banking sanctions were withdrawn or suspended, in fact, this did not work. And there is, coming back to now, there is an enormous uh, frustration from the Iranian side. Uh, if they agree to go to the table, they will ask, if you are saying, Mr. Biden or even Mr. Trump, we are going back to the GCPOE, fine, but do implement it. And we Iranians think that we have been kidded because uh, in spite of formal statements, uh, OFAC was uh, jeopardizing transactions and threatening banks, firms, and so on. So the first request from the Iranian side for going to the table will be, if we come back to GCPOE, please uh, confirm that you will implement it. Uh, actually not uh, verbally. 
Friends, right. and your second question, uh, there are very, very uh, a few transactions. You have heard, uh, heard about the Instax system, which has been <laughs> launched by the E3. Uh, in fact, after a first transaction, uh, it is currently uh, not working. You have been aware uh, as well of a Swiss system, a Swiss channel, which has been launched by Americans uh, with a, a Swiss, in particular with a Swiss bank. Uh, there had been a first preliminary transaction with the Swiss laboratory uh, and Novartis. Um, it may work. It, it, it is possible that it will work, but conditions are, uh, it is open to Swiss subsidiaries of foreign firms, including American. And my guess is that it was launched uh, in order to allow uh, US laboratories, which already trade with Iran. When you go to Iran and you ask some people, they confirm that are US transaction with uh, pharmaceutical laboratories. So it is the purpose of this Swiss channel is first to ease transactions uh, uh, with both a uh, subsidiary uh, of US laboratory and with some Swiss firms as a reward for good Swiss services to uh, American diplomacy. Uh, this remains very limited. Outside this, there are uh, uh, unofficial channels. Some companies are trying to trade only uh, in uh, uh, non-sanctioned sectors, uh, agriculture and food on one hand and, and uh, medicine. Uh, these are very limited transactions, but there are some. And at the end of the day, um, we know that there, there is an intense trend, uh, trade sorry, between Iran and its neighbors through various channels. We have quoted Turkey, but there are Iraq, there is with India, Malaysia, uh, Pakistan, and some others with uh, systems which are uh, similar to Instax, but not built uh, according to the same scheme. And uh, as uh, as you told us, there is a, an enormous black market according to the old recipes which were launched during the Amadejane presidency. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, Ricardo Redaeli, to you the, <laughs> the task of uh, putting all this together again, and maybe you can add other dimensions in, in terms of you know, whether the sanctions have worked, but also, what is the state of mind of the, of the Iranian society now living again in this uh, atmosphere of, uh, quote, you know, extreme pressure or, or you know, whatever it's called, by whatever the definition by, you know, Secretary Pompeo, you know, how is this, how is this working and, and how do the Iranians view their future in, the, in this complicated environment? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Paul. Uh, I don't want to, play the annoying role of being a professor. So answering with another question to your, to your question. But the problem is, uh, you know, sanctions, the idea of containment. Uh, uh, I never uh, properly understood what Americans and especially what this administration means with containment. Because if, you know, the problem is that the Trump administration, but not only the Congress, the Senate, the representatives, they are looking since many years, Iran, only through Sunni, Arab Sunni and Israeli eyes. So the, the image they have of Iran is distorted. And my idea is if you use the maximum pressure, you got back the maximum resistance. But sanctions were directed to contain Iran or to regime change. Because in Pompeo, Mr. Bolton, Mr. Pompeo, and sector of the Trump administration, the idea was not to contain Iran, but to destroy to the regime change, to make the Islamic Republic of Iran collapse. And I remember, as I, as I told you, I joined several for many years, since many years, uh, track to meetings. Uh, and I remember what uh, one of the leader of the passed around of the 
IRCG told me, see, why we are negotiating, why we are speaking informally? If it is for reaching an agreement, a compromise, we sit and discuss. But if you want to crush us, if you want regime change, there is nothing to discuss. So that's the point. It's not clear what Washington wants. And the problem of Washington is just looking to Iran via the Sunni Israeli eyes. So that is unbalancing our vision and our policy. They said that sanctions bites a lot, uh, but that will not crush the regime. On the contrary, they are supporting the worst part, the worst sectors of the regime. Anytime since 1997, when I was working in Iran, and there was the reformist period, anytime Iranian conservatives, anytime the Iranian radicals were on the defense, were uh, under pressure, Washington always made the wrong decision supporting them in, indirectly and weakening the reformists. Uh, you know, in Iran, the regime is extremely unpopular because it failed from an economic point of view, because it's illiberal, it's corrupted, because the young, if, if you speak with the young Iranians, are probably the most pro-Western uh, uh, of the Middle East. They want to have uh, music, uh, having fun. So they dislike, the vast majority of the Iranians dislike the regime. But of course, the, you, you, with this policy, you just force, and, and my colleagues, they already told that, you, you put them in a corner, they have no other alternatives. So uh, when we say what the Iranians think is which part of Iran you're thinking, which sector of a very fragmented Iran we are thinking. But the more you put pressure and the more you oblige them to stay united, despite their unwillingness, maximum pressure is the most wrong possible policy with Iran, if you wish to moderate Tehran. And I, my impression then Iranians are beyond hope. I remember what an Iranian told me recently, even if there is a Biden president, then I, 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 I'm concluding, it's extremely difficult to put the toothpaste back into the tube once you are squeezed. So even Biden, which was less friendly with Tehran than President Obama, it's, it would be extremely difficult for Mr. Biden to revert, to put the toothpaste back into the uh, Indeed. Well, uh, thank you for that. But so let's move. Let's try to move on here, uh, Michelle. I I don't see your 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 image. I don't know if uh -huh. something happened. Your video is off, okay. Michelle Makinsky. Uh, can you, uh, I don't see your 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 video. Uh, Maybe you can turn it on again. I don't know. Uh, okay, but let's let's. Uh, let's yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, we're we're now we're all we're all here. Uh, Fazel, back to you. Uh, if, you know, if we, I think there's a bit of a consensus here in this on this panel that this policy, whatever its intentions, uh, putting pressure and or, as uh, Ricardo just uh, mentioned, regime change, you know, to, that via pressures you would exert so much pressure on, on the on the economy on everything that the pot will boil over and there will be some kind of an insurrection and that will topple the Ayatollah regime, and that will be fantastic because we start again. So that's not happening. And, and as Ricardo said, you know, there's no, and also Arzu, I think, mentioned that the regime is too strong for this, and the opposition too fragmented and, and disunited. Mm -hmm. So again, what, what are we going to do that is more productive? What are the avenues ahead? And, in, and indeed, considering that it's hard to put the, you know, the toothpaste back in the in the tube once it's all out, is there a, is there a better way that is also you know not idealistic but pragmatic? Whoever is elected president on November third here in Washington, can we do something that tones down the uh, tensions 
and uh, engage Iran in, in a way that is uh, agreeable to everybody? Is that possible or is that a, just a dream? Fazl. Um, well, it, it, it's kind of, um, I mean, the window of opportunity existed uh, in the JCPOA, and then now that window has shrunk. I think we lost. Puzzle, uh, your, okay. your audio is off. Oh, I, um, okay. yeah, um, I, I'm sorry. Uh, so what I was saying was that um, the, the window of opportunity has lapsed. And right now you're really working at a very narrow angle to expand that opportunity. I just don't think it's possible because, you know, let's say, for instance, Biden does become president. He has about four months to make something out of this, which is impractical, given the fact that on May 2021, Iranians are going to go uh, to their election booths. And there's overwhelming evidence that more hardliners are going to creep into the leadership of not just the presidency, but also the parliament. And this is not just hardline, but IRGC hardline, which is really much more confrontational than previous uh, dialogues would have you believe. Um, so to answer your question accurately, the window is very, very limited. Well, uh, Arzu, uh, from, from a Turkish uh, perspective, or at least based on where you are in Ankara and looking at the region, is there anything that you can see that could be constructively done? And could Turkey play, given its rather unique relationship with Iran, at least as compared to the United States and as compared to Europe, can, do you envisage some kind of a path towards a more relaxed environment here? Arzu. Um, yeah. Well, um, always there's a way, actually. In the Iranian nuclear crisis, we lost a lot of time during the Bush government. We were talking about the Iranian nuclear crisis, but nothing was negotiated by the United States in order to solve the problem because we have preconditions, even we couldn't find the way to open a negotiation. So we lost the time and uh, this, this, what, those were the years that Iran uh, developed its nuclear program and come to a threshold that everybody uh, now are frightened uh, that it has the capacity to build a nuclear bomb, right? Uh, those were the lost years. And now we have one thing in hand, which is I think uh, JCPOA uh, is a really good agreement uh, because all of the, the P5 plus one and the United States are on the table and they finally convinced Iran to sit on the table and uh, doing something. And actually uh, by this agreement, they uh, managed to restrict Iran's nuclear program to the minimum extent. And this was important really. Um, from now on, I think that um, we have to do something to find a way between the, the Obama's policy and the Trump's policy, because on both sides, both the United States and the Iranian sides, we have both uh, moderates and hawks. So uh, we have to find a midway in that manner. And um, what are the concerns? The concerns are uh, restricting Iran to not build a nuclear bomb, right? This is the first one. We can manage this by the, the, the current agreement, okay? The other concern is the Iranians' activities and behavior in the region. So in that manner, we can ask Iranians to sit on the table and finally do something regarding to those concerns. But while doing this, we cannot just punishing Iran. I mean, the time passed. As uh, the Ricardo is saying, uh, we cannot put the toothpaste again in the tube. And now the hardliners are so strong in the Iran. And, um, the, the, the coercive diplomacy, especially the one which is more um, stronger sanctions and uh, even the, the, the military attack rumors, um, those are not working because, um, because we, have, we have to do, find a midway here. 
Turkey, Turkey did it in the past. Uh, if you remember with Brazil, Turkey made this Tehran declaration and uh, actually Turkey faced a lot of criticism from the United States part saying that, why did you interfere in that? And the United States was not happy with that uh, initiative. But I'm sure that Turkey will be ready to, to do uh, what is, has to be done because uh, one of the countries that be more um, affected from the even nuclear uh, sanctions, I mean, the sanctions that will be the, the, uh, applied on the Iran or uh, a military confrontation on the Iran, uh, since we have border with Iran, uh, Turkey is one of the most critical countries uh, that will be affected. So in the, in the sake of a better and safer uh, region, Turkey will do what it can do. But I think that till the US presidency, the elections, uh, Turkey will pursue the, the wait and see approach because uh, the, the elections will be a game changer in that manner. Well, thank you. Uh, Michelle uh, McKinsky, uh, now we uh, hear uh, from our fellow panelists that uh, the unfortunate, uh, you know, unintended consequence of the sanctions has been the strengthening of, of, the, of the more intransigent radicals yes. in, uh, in Iran. Yes. Now, that obviously it's not a good, uh, you know, sure. if it's happening, it's happening and the elections are coming up as, uh, as Fazl mentioned. If we uh, have managed to make Iran more intransigent, then that makes it uh, paradoxically more difficult, it seems to me, to engage uh, the new Iranian leadership, whatever will emerge, uh, in a productive fashion to lessen tensions in the region. I mean, for, you know, on the one hand, we've got the Iran deal, sorry, the nuclear deal, but then we've got all these other matters that concerns Americans. And let's not be unrealistic here. Thousands of Americans have been killed in Iraq by Im improvised explosive devices, you know, planted uh, in, in Iraq by uh, Shia militias uh, trained by the Iranians. This is not, you know, just a minor issue. This is something that really hurts here in Washington, not to mention the fact, and everybody knows it, but I think it's worth mentioning, people still remember the hostage crisis. Yes, it was 40 years ago. It was a long time ago. Many Americans were not born, you know, uh, when this happened. And yet the memory is still there. Uh, you know, the humiliation uh, suffered. Uh, you know, Jimmy Carter was president. Uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski was a national security advisor. And Cyrus Vance, you know, was secretary of state. This looks like another geological era. And yet, believe me, you know, the memory of that uh, experience is still stinging. So there is a lot going on and maybe baggage and emotions and what have you. But Michelle, I'm asking you a very difficult question. You know, we have perhaps made things worse with the Trump policy of, of these sanctions. Now we're going to have perhaps a more intransigent, you know, Iranian leadership. Given this facts or probabilities, is there still some kind of an avenue for dialogue, for lessening tensions in the region, say starting, say, with Syria, which of course affects Turkey very much as well, because another neighboring state in which, uh, you know, Turkey has uh, considerable interests, which are certainly not aligned with the interests, uh, I would say, um, of, uh, of, Syri of, of, of Iran. So given all this, uh, Michelle, do you see some kind of path forward or maybe step-by-step -step confidence building measures that we could have and that the Iranians can be convinced that no, we're not after regime change, but we want to have some lessening of tensions and we would like to see things improving in the region. Again, your video yeah. is uh, gone, uh, Michelle. Yes, I see. Going to uh, Zoom. Well, we can hear you. Okay. But so, uh, in, in a nutshell, two, three, two things. One, uh, the supreme leader says we will never negotiate. You have to translate it as following. We will negotiate first, but uh, according to certain 
conditions. Um, the first condition is uh, what of a president, Biden or Trump, if uh, an agreement uh, is to be discussed, again, the main issue should be to uh, allow Iran to trade and to receive money from exports. Uh, this is a red line because, again, the issue was existing before Trump and the GCP was not properly implemented uh, from the US side. Second, uh, on the nuclear issue, uh, there is uh, an arbitrator, the International uh, uh, Agency of, on nuclear, nuclear Issues. Uh, this body is, is the only one entitled to, to state whether Iran is complying uh, uh, or pursuing its uh, uh, nuclear hidden program. Uh, people adopting uh, on the efficacy of the agency. This is legend. They are extremely efficient. They have all kinds of uh, investigation too. Therefore, if we want to, to ascertain whether Iranian is either complying or intended to comply, we must, we must deal with the agency. And any effort uh, I devote would be to persuade whatever American leadership to, uh, to rely upon the agency without feeding said agency with a, a, a fake uh, fabricated so-called proof directly imported from Tel Aviv, uh, which is not a, a, a proper way for addressing a very complicated issue. Now, on, on the regional issues, again, Iran is certainly open uh, to discuss uh, this on Syria. This uh, will rely upon current negotiations, which are uh, handled mainly by Russians, but there is another group which is uh, discussing. And the uh, way for progressing would be to get both groups to, uh, uh, to uh, I would say, to meet under United Nations umbrella. Uh, on Yemen, uh, I, I told someone the, the well-known story. Zarif told in February 2017, uh, answering a, a, a US journalist who asked him whether Iran had any strategic interest in Yemen. He answered, none, because Yemen is only a tactic tool uh, with very, very low investment with very big return. So uh, Yemen will be extremely easy to negotiate. On missiles, contrary to legends, the ballistic missiles can be easily discussed because the main military uh, threat from Iran are, uh, is not those missiles, but the cruise missiles, which have been extremely effective and are really dangerous. So we should clarify the real, uh, the real targets the real issues, the real concerns, and then through a process of clarification handled by proper individuals and proper bodies, again, the agency for the nuclear issues, we may uh, open some uh, uh, room for effective discussions. But this depends on whether if Trump is reelected, he wants a, a good bargain or he wants a regime change. That's up to him. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Ricardo, then uh, to, back to you. Do you see, based on your obviously vast and textured experience, some kind of an opening somewhere? Uh, again, I, I fully agree uh, with what you said before, you know, and I think it's important to clarify that uh, the Trump administration has been particularly eager to sanction left and right uh, almost everybody. We sanction or we put, you know, uh, tariffs, uh, you know, on, uh, uh, I don't know, Canadian aluminum, which is clearly a threat to American national security, as everybody knows, because the Canadians, I don't know, are about to invade the United States, you know, any day, you know, they represent a serious uh, 
threat to our well-being, the Canadians, right? So obviously, and you know, and now we've got sanctions against Iran, we got sanctions against Venezuela, sanctions here, sanctions there, tariffs galore from any, to anybody from China where there's, you know, there are other issues which are more legitimate, but against Korea or, or Europe or because of automobiles and, and Japan, et cetera, et cetera. There is, seems to be this uh, tendency to try to resolve every issue you know, with sanctions. Hopefully a Biden administration, assuming you know, whatever, whatever will be the outcome of the elections on November 3rd will, will be different. But so to you, uh, Ricardo, then how, how does this work? I mean, uh, can we, in this admittedly deteriorated environment, right? It's gotten worse in the last few years. Is there some kind of a path forward? Is, can we envisage you know, diplomacy and politics always being the art of the possible? Do you see anything there that would say, okay, we can start with this, maybe confidence building measures, some you know, minor issue that could be addressed without too much commitment and too much you know, uh, you know, uh, risking too much political capital. Is there anything there yeah. from your perspective? Yeah, thanks, Paolo. Very good question because this is a core issue. I, I do believe that there is always a path there is always a possibility, even in the most deteriorated condition. Uh, you know, uh, looking in a historical perspective, uh, we had many possibilities to reach an agreement to, uh, 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 I remember in 97, 99, 2003, 2005, 2009, very different Iranian uh, uh, political contest in 1970 up to 2005, there were the reformists. Then with Ahmadinejad, an ultra-radical, extremely anti-American. We had several possibilities to reach an agreement, a small comprehensive dialogue. We always missed this opportunity for both, both sides, Iran and the West. But there are always channel and possibility. And the fact that we know Iranians are uh, furious because Trump uh, withdraw from the deal. And the next year we will have a conservative president. But conservative doesn't mean a lot. Because if we have a conservative like a former Pazdaran like Mr. Khalibaf, the Speaker of the Parliament, he's extremely modern, extremely open to, to, to discussion, to see if there is a possibility. For me, we have to first to wait till the Iranian election, middle of May, June 2000, 2001, uh, um, because before the election is too sensitive. Then we have to see the president who is not so important as a matter of fact, but we, we can send signal and messages before a sort of selective engagement, uh, uh, reopening the track two. In the past, there were dozens of track two and useful or not, successful or not, but you know, they, they were keeping contact with the society, with the de micote, with, the, with these demi-official, semi-official things. And now the, most of, of them are, are, are stopped. We can hope to have a better role from EU. As a European, I, I hope that Europe can, with a different American president, I don't want to say to take the lead, but to do something more. Then we know Europeans are always irrelevant. That's, that's a tradition, but we can do something. And then what is important is, is like after a crash, car crash accident, you have to restart having the confidence of having the possibility to drive without trouble. Iranians, and then I'm closing my, my answer, you know the Rakhbar Khamenei didn't trust the Americans, but he supported Rouhani and Mr. Zarif in closing the deal. And when Trump withdrew, he told, I told you we cannot trust America. So this is his set of mind. We have to reopen slowly, you know, his mindset that it's possible to negotiate 
and to reach tactical uh, good agreement on specific and selected point. But if we start or we rejoin the, the nuclear agreement and then you have to discuss about the missile and the human rights and that and that, so that's, that's, okay. that's the most wrong, the wrongest way possible. So Arzu, do, do you agree that it may be possible from, from where you are to have some kind of a small steps approach and where perhaps, you know, uh, Turkey's uh, in better position diplomatically, at least uh, with, with Iran, may be a, a good, uh, you know, instrument, uh, like uh, that the Turkey could potentially support and help this, uh, uh, I mean, a, a good faith effort to reach some kind of maybe small agreements on, on smaller issues uh, to recreate uh, what is, you know, uh, confidence, um, you know, and, and at least establish a working relationship between the parties. Do you see that Turkey could perform this role uh, in the future uh, after maybe after the Iranian elections? Well, um, regarding the Turkish-Iranian relations, uh, in, in, in brief, I can say that those countries for hundreds of years are famous rivals. But on the other hand, these two countries know that they have common interests and common security and common economic, both threats and cooperation fields. They are very well aware of this and they act in a manner to protect all this. They know that the, the, the unrestful in one country will have a spill over to the other side of the border. So this is important. It doesn't matter that nowadays Iran and Turkey are not uh, agree on lots of issues in the region or other things. This is not the, the matter of the fact, actually. Regarding the Iranian nuclear crisis, I'm sure that the Turkish government is the one who firstly wants this issue to be solved. Because uh, we have been dealing with this till 2003 and it had its impacts on Turkey uh, from time to time, and we know that Turkey was active in some point of uh, uh, that period. Uh, but as I told you before, now Turkey will wait for the uh, US president's elections, and um, also we will see what will happen in Iran. Wait and see policy, because uh, we have our own dynamics here, and um, the, we have to wait and see for a while to see what will happen. But I'm sure that um, not in, maybe not in the sh short term, but in the mid term, Turkey will be we will be eager to be active um, in a process which will solve this. And uh, regarding that, is there a possibility to do that? Yes, there is always a way. We, as I told uh, at the beginning of my speech, we missed a lot of opportunity to solve this issue. A lot of opportunity because uh, the main issue was not solving the Iranian nuclear crisis, it was changing the Iranian regime. And uh, it was voiced by several US leaders. I mean, uh, as you may remember, the Condoleezza Rice first said this, we want to change the Iranian regime. And this was uh, something big for Iran and during the Ahmadinejad term. So uh, you will not expect the country to sit on the same table with you and somebody says that, hey, I'm coming to change your regime. I mean, this is not a kind of uh, solution. And uh, we are talking about Iran. I mean, not Islamic Republic of Iran. We are talking about Iran uh, with, with uh, thousands of years history. So uh, this, is, this is not Iraqi people uh, saying that, hey, US, come here and change our regime. No, this will not happen in Iran. Even the people who are not in favor of the current regime will not say, okay, yes, US, come and change our regime. This is, this is not something that they will accept. So uh, what, what can be done? A more productive way to approach Iran under a new administration would be for US first to return to JCPO and at least partially lift the sanctions while Iran resumes its full, full compliance and reverse all increases in the levels of its enriched uranium, maybe gradually. 
that the new administration should allow U.S. companies to deal with Iran and uh, prepare the way for dialogue on regional and other issues. But we have to give something to Iran. I mean, we are talking about carrots and sticks. You cannot just show the sticks. You have to show carrots. And um, once, once Iran did this and saying that, hey, I'm in compliance with the agreement. I'm on the table. I was uh, waiting for the EU and the United Nations to, to convince the United States uh, to, to eliminate the sanctions and did nothing. But I see nothing changed. And now I began to enrich my uranium. I mean, this is the Iranian side's point of view, which is to somehow rational. OK, but if you want to convince Iran with more stronger hardliners now, you have to give something. You have to uh, really make confidence building measures, mm. sitting on the table and gradually doing something. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, here, if I may just interject very quickly, you know, we have a hard time in the United States uh, uh, embracing the concept that all of you kind of alluded to, that you can and should engage with adversaries, uh, even though you don't like them, and maybe you abhor them, because we don't like a theocratic regime, we don't like a, you know, people who are ideologically inspired and think that they are the next wave for world revolution, etc. But let's not forget, you know, President Nixon uh, and, 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 and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger engaged with the Soviet Union, right? Detente, it was called. Not because all of a sudden America discovered back in the 1970s that we like we liked Soviet communism, but because it was considered to be of pragmatic self-interest of the United States to uh, stabilize the world situation and try to figure out a way uh, to create a, a modus vivendi with the then Soviet Union. Of course, at that point, nobody would forecast that the Soviet Union would disappear. But, but at the time, in the 1970s, we did repeatedly engage and, and, you know, and American leaders spent hundreds of hours you know, with the likes of uh, Leonid Brezhnev and, 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 uh, and uh, Gramico and all that to stabilize the world situation. And this was not because all of a sudden we, we decided that the Soviet leaders were nice, but because it was in our self-interest. And I think that this is a, something that is quite problematic still in the United States to embrace as a sort of a normative principle of diplomacy. The idea is that you don't talk to bad people, right? And, uh, and, and that's what they are labeled, bad people. And so this makes things a lot more complicated, but that's just my own uh, digression. I apologize for that. And the minutes we got left, I wanted to introduce, just because we don't have enough problems here, um, you know, another dimension to all this. And that, and that is you know, the maneuvering uh, which with some success on the part of the Trump administration to bring together Israel and the Sunni monarchies of the Gulf, where clearly in this uh, diplomatic maneuvering, which led to the establishment recently now, as everybody knows, of diplomatic relations between Bahrain, uh, the United Arab Emirates and, and Israel, that there is a clearly an anti-Iranian bent which led from behind here, although you know, clearly by Saudi Arabia, where the, where the obvious objective here is to create a, a, a counterweight to Iranian influence. Now, is, that, is this issue of the Sunni Arabs against Shia Iran now with the open, more or less, support of Israel, is that a complicating factor? How, how does that work? I mean, it, or is that not really a relevant issue because the key parties are those of the GCPOA, and so the Arabs are kind of, you know, side, you know, kind of a ancillary players. Fuzzle. Any any thought on that? We we got to make this quick. I, I would like everybody to say something. It's not entirely a Sunni angle. Uh, you do have Sunni countries that are very much in the intermediary process and are in. Uh, in a business uh, setting process with Iran, uh, Qatar, Oman, uh, these are 
very, um, I mean, I wouldn't say they are making the headlines, but they do have significant weight. Um, so there is one division within the Sunni Gulf states in itself, one that is wanting to work with Iran, the other that's taken on a much more uh, aggressive tone, primarily because uh, there is this feeling that uh, for F I mean, particularly in the setting with Bahrain and, and UAE, uh, UAE has two islands that um, they are contending sovereignty that they claim belongs to them, but Iran also claims the sovereignty to that. There is friction there. Bahrain believes that Iran is sending uh, militias into its waters to overthrow its regime. So there is that sense of fear. So you do have this, these two countries that are very, very suspicious of Iran's activities in the region. Um, and so I'll end up with that. Thank you. Again, sorry, very quickly, because I'm advised we have uh, very little time left. Uh, Michel, any thoughts on the role of the Sunni Arab monarchies in, 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 in this uh, complicated scenario? Um, it is uh, adding complexity to local issues, but not to the nuclear debate. So we have to split the, the two topics. Um, uh, it remains to be seen, first of all, uh, uh, the size of the membership. Who will finally uh, join? You, you have seen that uh, Qatar and Oman will certainly not join. So it is not a Sunni, uh, a Sunni uh, team, but rather a, a, an Arabian, I mean, a Saudi Arabian team uh, with a target uh, reinforcing uh, the uh, GCC, which is currently very weak as a strategic tool. And uh, in the prospect of the future or role of these countries as subcontractors vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States. If we keep in mind that the United States are intended not to fully withdraw from the Middle East because it's stupid, but to, de to decrease some part of the involvement, uh, there is a clear tactic to, to get those states with so, uh, Israel support becoming uh, 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 local issues subcontractors. Thank you. Arzu, any, any, any thoughts since you, you know, you're coming from a, obviously a Sunni uh, country uh, and Iran being Shia and how and clear, and I know of clearly relations with Saudi Arabia are not that great after the, you know, the well-known events in the, at the Saudi uh, consular office in Istanbul. Uh, so how, how do you view this uh, anti-Iranian coalition with the, um, is that, does that, in other words, does that make any difference? Or is that just a complicating factor, as, uh, as uh, Michelle put it? Well, actually, um, not generally speaking about the Sunni world, but we can specifically talking about the Saudi Arabia and Israel regarding that issue, because those two countries are not happy with, the nuclear power, with the Iran with a nuclear power. I mean, Saudi Arabia uh, has its own concerns and uh, Israel has uh, its own threat perception regarding that issue. But I want to mention that another topic that we have to put on the table is um, Israel's nuclear program as well, because Iran saying that uh, if you are wondering what I'm doing, so you, you have to look at the Israel, which has the opacity policy regarding the nuclear program. And... Um, if, are, if the, the second and gradual thing will be about the regional issues, this will be another uh, matter that has, has to be put on the uh, table. So I think that the United States um, has to convince Israel and Saudi Arabia specifically that uh, it will uh, uh, negotiate with Iran and Iran will not be a problem in the framework of an international cooperation. And uh, after convincing them, uh, maybe something will be happen. Well, thank you, Ricardo. Uh, just if you can uh, kindly wrap it all up, all up for us, and 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 just to give us your final thoughts on this. Yeah, you know, most of the Sunni Arab countries and the monarchies and Israel oppose the agreement. They violently oppose the, the agreement. I don't see a lot of change, but this is not only a problem of state, it's also a problem of person. MBS, that is to say, Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia, extreme obsessed by Iran, MBZ in the Emirates, obsessed, despite the fact that the Emirates are more, you know, more divided than they can 
open up a bit. In Israel, it's a problem of Bibi Netanyahu because other parts, and especially the army, is more relaxed when we speak, when you speak about, about Iran. But in general, I don't, do not expect in the future a support from the region in favor of any kind of agreement with Iran. And that's a problem, of course, for us, and for Europe, and for, for, for Mr. Biden, if he's elected. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, all of you, for being so kind with your time. And thank you for being uh, disciplined <laughs> with the use of your, of your time. I really appreciate that. Uh, I guess uh, this is, uh, you know, we wrap this all up. I hear some uh, timid, at least, but, but not inconsequential uh, feelings that possibilities always exist, that diplomacy is, uh, is still available, and that better days may come, but we will have to wait for some milestones, in particular, obviously, the U.S. elections, but that will be only just in a few days, and more significantly, the Iranian elections that have been discussed uh, um, earlier in the panel. To our panelists, uh, many, many thanks for your kind contribution. And maybe we'll have to, you know, soon enough uh, revisit this uh, complicated matters. I guess we, as they say, stand adjourned. Thank you very much. And thanks Thank to the you. audience for following Thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.